You're watching The Penny Hardaway Show, presented by Cook's Pest Control. The better Tigers reside in Tennessee as Memphis takes out Clemson. We'll recap that game, sit down with Caleb Bills, and look ahead to a big week ahead with home matchups against Virginia and Vanderbilt. It's The Penny Hardaway Show. Let's go. The Penny Hardaway Show is presented by Cook's Pest Control. You don't have to live with pests. Call Cook's Pest Control and get a free quote today. Conway Services, the official HVAC partner of Tiger Athletics. Tennessee Lottery, turning dollars into dreams. Tiger Bookstore, the official merchandiser of Tiger Athletics. AutoZone, when you've got car trouble, you want help from number one. So if you've got a battery problem, Head to AutoZone, America's number one battery destination. Get in the zone, AutoZone. And supported by your Memphis area Toyota dealers. Oh, it was good to be back home. And down goes another top 25. Hi, everybody. I'm Dave Wolosian. And I'm Matt Enfield. Memphis Tigers over Clemson Tigers. Let's check out the highlights. A battle of Tigers as Memphis returns home for the first time in a month to battle number 13 Clemson. Tiger great DeAndre Williams in the house. Huge ovation when he was recognized at the first time out. Clemson came out of the gates hot. Memphis not rattled. David Jones in transition. Maru Ginobili would be proud of this Euro step finish. Later in the half, Caleb Bills goes up and under. High off glass for the beautiful bucket. Clemson led by seven at the half though. Our defensive player of the week is Malcolm Dandridge, the definition of a winning play. The steal walks the tightrope to stay in bounds, misses the tough layup, but Jalen Young with the putback. Memphis takes a one point lead. The outstanding performer of the game is Javon Quinterly, drops a no look dime to Jones for the bucket. Two point Memphis lead late. JQ comes up with the steal, recovers and finds Malco running the floor for the jam. 72-68 U of M. More from Quinterly, 17 points for him. These two give Memphis a three-point lead with about a minute left. Under two seconds to play. Clemson down two after making a free throw. Missed the second one on purpose, but Malco comes up with the rebound. Ball game. Memphis hands Clemson their first loss of the season. Pick up another enormous non-conference win, 79-77. Coach, in your sixth year, you've built several different staffs. So in your mind, what are you thinking about as you assemble a bunch of assistant coaches? Well, for the associate, it's more so about the experience. The experienced guy that's been through so many games, that's coached so many games, that's won a lot of games and then just have gone through so many different things of the game of basketball, practices, games, recruiting, things of that nature. With the other coaches, it's been more about energy and hard work because out on the floor, we need the energy and hard work. I think with marrying my style with a veteran guy and then the energy of the other younger guys or other coaches, it just bodes well for me here in Memphis. So Frank Haith leaves after last year, you bring in Rick. I think a lot of people might think that you wouldn't want someone with that level of experience on your staff just in case there are too many voices. Who do players listen to? You seem to welcome that. How come? Yeah, I mean, it's just like with Frank. Those guys just, you know, I'm, I'm always going to be cup half empty guy that's always going to take the knowledge and not think about it in any other way. And uh, what Coach Stansberry has done is, it's not too many voices. He just gives me the right info. I can process what I want to process out of it and take from it what I want to take from it. And to me, I'd rather have the, the knowledge there than not. And then there's a guy that you know for a long time in Faraji Phillips, who you lured away from the team you're going to play this year right. in Vanderbilt. Talk a little bit about that process. Well, first, he's one of my, my good friends. We uh, When I was still playing basketball in the summertime, he and I would always be teammates. And I just noticed his hard work and his energy from just playing. Then when we coached against each other and I watched him coach, uh, I just saw the tenacity and the energy that he, we, we kind of have the same philosophy on defense and being aggressive. And uh, when I had the opportunity to hire him, I hired him because of his toughness, his energy, and his, his aggressiveness on the defensive end. Eddie Borman obviously has some pretty good coaching genes in his family, but he is his own man. What attracted you to him? Yeah, I think that watching him coach the New York Rens, the EYBO team, 
He's always had a ton of talent, but he's always done a fantastic job of organizing and being disciplined. Uh, his team's been organized and disciplined, and that's tough to do in today's age. So I've always respect how he's carried himself and the culture that they built with the New York Rens. So when he became you know, available and, and wanted to interview for the job, I interviewed him and, and hired him. And then there's an, another new guy in Jamie Rosser. What was the attraction there? And I think you you know him. You might have coached him at one point. <laughs> no, I didn't coach him, but I know Jamie really well. Uh, fantastic player, ended up going to Arkansas State as a point guard, but just a Memphis homegrown guy. You know, I had Rodney Hamilton and Tony Medlock and JJ, uh, Jermaine Johnson. So now it's Jamie Rosser, a guy that knows the lay of the land, understands what Memphis basketball means to the city, and he can kind of, you know, help me get that word out here with the guys. That leads into my next question. You're not going to hand guys a job because they have connections to the city, but there are a couple guys on the staff who do have Memphis connections. How important is it to have those connections on your staff? It's very important because they understand the mission of the city and the school. Like the white boy that's here, you know, he bleeds blue. You know, he played in the uniform, won a lot of games in the uniform, and was on the teams that made me really want to come here to Memphis. So with them having that in their blood, it, uh, it definitely helps the guys understand Every game we go into, it's about the city and about the school. And you know, you gave him the chief of staff description. And believe it or not, AM had a guy that was called chief of staff. First time I've I've ever seen that before. Yeah, I created a spot for him because he does so much for me. Uh, the chief of staff, he kind of oversees everyone. And uh, he's a guy that does a fantastic job. And uh, I'm happy to have him. You can have that title if you want. No, no. I'm very happy okay. that my man, the greatest free throw <laughs> shooter, by the way, you compete with all the time, that he's got that thing. Talk to me uh, when you're putting out roles. Do you say you're going to be, other than myself, the main recruiter and you're going to do this? How do you work that out? Yeah, I kind of, with recruiting, I'm the guy because I feel like the kid needs to have a personal relationship with me. I know most coaches will go out and get kids and they'll let the assistants recruit the kid the entire time and they come in and close the deal. For me, I like to be hands-on. So what I do with my guys is on the court stuff. Okay, you have rebounding, you have stick hand, you have defense, you have who run, who sprints back, you have who crashed the glass, all these different things. And then we have 365 groups. You have this group of four, you have this group of four, meet with these guys, watch film, get on the court, so we can be better as a team. So Rick obviously is the associate head coach for the other three, Andy, Faraji, Jamie, how do you divvy up their responsibilities? I know Faraji, more of a defensive background, Jamie, player development, what else we got going on? You, you hit the nail on the head. You know, Faraji's more with the defense slash player development. Jamie's with the, you know, the player development. And Coach Stansberry is just a guy that goes around just spitting knowledge and, 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 and giving uh, his expertise in different areas. Andy? Andy is the guy that's just gonna go out and do uh, the development, and he's gonna watch film with guys. And then you've got so many young guys that uh, I know uh, Rodney Carney's got a family member that's a part of this that you, I guess, are bringing in and teaching them the ropes. Yeah, well, what I try to do is not only be a coach, but to be a mentor as well, because everyone that works under me, well, a lot of these guys that work under me want to be coaches one day. So I welcome them in, we go over video, we talk about different scenarios, different schemes, different defenses, different offenses, and just try to get their knowledge up. So when they move on and hopefully become a head coach one day or an assistant coach, they'll be well-versed. A term you brought up before, the mission of the city. What does that mean to you? It means everything to me. Born and raised here, understand that we haven't won a championship here yet at the University of Memphis, and I'm hoping to be the first to do so. Caleb Bills started his career as an arch enemy of Memphis. Now he's a key part of what the Tigers hope to accomplish this year. We'll sit down with him. Coming up next. You're watching The Penny Hardaway Show, presented by Cook's Pest Control. Welcome back to The Penny Hardaway Show. Caleb Bills has had a winding collegiate career that's included two stops before this. All those experiences, combined with some growing up, has put him in position to be a selfless leader for this Tigers team. Caleb grew up in Arden, North Carolina, the son of a college basketball player. His dad played at Brevard College in the Tar Heel State, a blessing and a curse for Caleb. At times it can be annoying um, because especially when you're young, you're, not ever, you're never right. You never do good enough, uh, which I, I think that's how it should be um, because it, it, it made me the person who I am today. Super competitive, my work hard, my work ethic is uh, uh, super nice. 
and I just have a better understanding of the game, especially younger. Basketball was in his blood, but he took another sport seriously as a kid, kickball. Did I read something about kickball as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I used to play that uh, the time between five and nine. That's where I used to, I used to try to find the best shoes so I could take them to recess. And I was always first pick. I used to go at Timberlands in the summer. <laughs> Tim's in the summer just because they helped you with kickball? Yeah. Did you, are, are there pro kickball leagues out there? Is that something you ever want to pursue? That's what I used to think pursue? about. I used to think about that, but uh, I don't think that's a thing. They should make it a thing. But in the end, it always came back to hoops. His grandfather, who works in real estate, actually built a court for Caleb's entire neighborhood to use and hone their skills. He, the neighborhood where I grew up in, we call it Millsville, because it's, uh, my great-grandfather was the one who kind of established it, but uh, my grandfather continued it. Yeah, he had a lot of property down there. We call it Millsville because a lot of my relatives stay there. Uh, he built the court 2012, 2011. I can't remember the exact date. It's on the back of the court. He engraved it. But uh, still there. The, the goal is a little messed up. But uh, I think he's going he gonna to fix it up. When did basketball become more serious and you figure out, okay, I can do this at a pretty high level? When I probably realized I was uh, probably going to go somewhere with basketball was probably my summer going from ninth to 10th grade. That's when I started taking it super serious. I work out probably six times a day. Get up early, stay up late. Six times a day? Yeah. Not <laughs> how do you all fit were. That, how do you fit that in? Not all were all basketball workouts. Some were like we'd do pool workouts in the morning, or we'll run, do speed training, then we'd uh, lift, then we'd play basketball, then we'd uh, uh, work out some, I don't remember exactly, and then we'd come back to, oh, we used to go to the place called the lab, and we'd do like individual workouts, and at the end, We'd uh, go to the, um, it's called Carolina Day School, and we'd train with, uh, his name's John Williams. Mills was a high school basketball star and a great student, which means he had plenty of schools recruiting him out of high school, including a few of the most prestigious universities in the country. The one place I was um, looking forward to visiting was Harvard, just because I didn't want to go there, of course, but uh, just to be able to say I visited. Um, but I had a, a good list of schools. I was doing it for my mom because she was, I mean, I wanted to myself, of course, but my mom was just raving, talking about Harvard. I was like, I guess I'll go. Do you have any other Ivy League schools after you? Um, Princeton, Yale, um, those are the three I remember. In the end, Mills took his talents to Houston, where in his one full season with the Cougars, he led the team in scoring and they were AAC co-regular season champions, but he can acknowledge it wasn't all smooth. Um, I mean, of course it was fun. Uh, um, playing with uh, the guys I played with um, made it easy. You know, I was playing with Marcus Sasser at the time, um, Dejan, uh, those super unselfish guys. Still talk to uh, all my uh, teammates from then. I still talk to them today. Um, I look back on it and it's, I, I've grown a lot since. Uh, I can see how uh, it could have been hard to play with me at the time. You know, I was a super, it was, everything was about me, you know what I'm saying? But you got to sacrifice at times for the greater good of the team. When you say hard to play with you, we talk about kind of a lot of, a lot of iso balls, yeah, stuff like yeah. that. Like I needed the ball all the time. And it's, it can it can be more detrimental to a team. Mills was the AAC preseason player of the year going to his sophomore season with the Cougars. But after playing in just four games, he left the program entirely. I was, it was a tough time. It was COVID going on and I was injured. Um, I had missed the first, like, I don't remember exactly, it means six, five games of the season. First game, I came back against Texas Tech in a little tournament. In the first play, I boxed out. And I rolled my ankle again, but I kept playing. So I was battling a lot, and then I was preseason player of the year. So, of course, I had, like, a, I guess I felt like I deserved stuff instead of having to earn it. So, um, out of immaturity and just poor judgment, I guess, I just decided to leave. I made a bad decision leaving, uh, immaturity struck. Um, I'm not afraid to admit that. Uh, I learned from it though, and I've gotten better since leaving, um, make the best out of the decision I made. Mills landed in Tallahassee where he spent two seasons at Florida State. He had high hopes, but after the Seminoles went just nine and 23 last season, he knew change was necessary. I've never been in a situation where um, it was like almost impossible to win, you know what I'm saying? Uh, so it was, it was definitely hard at times. You know, I kept working, you know, I'm resilient, but it definitely was tough. 
Mills entered the transfer portal, and before anyone from U of M reached out to him, he already had his eyes on the 901. Coach, uh, Coach Brendan called me. Um, it wasn't really like a, like I kind of had my mindset. I was waiting on the call from Memphis. Kind of had my mindset on where I wanted to go. Well, we talked, it wasn't really nothing uh, too, too uh, like he wasn't super analytical. He wasn't saying stuff that I wouldn't be able to resonate with. It was just basic level conversation. Um, I knew from the start I was gonna come here. So you do before he even reached out to you? Yeah, I was just, I'm, I'm, when he called me, I'm just gonna, he gonna know I'm coming. How come? I want to play for him. I know that uh, I'll do good here, and I know who it will. On a team full of transfers who are used to being the guy, sacrifice will be key in making sure the Tigers reach their peak. Mills set that example recently when he volunteered to come off the bench. What went into that? Uh, we had lost, I had asked coach before Ole Miss, because the first group we had on the floor, it just wasn't starting the way that we wanted to. Um, whether I, I was a problem or not, I was open for a change. Uh, I didn't know who was gonna start, but I, I know regardless if I'm starting, if I'm on the bench, coming off six man, whatever the case may be, I'm gonna play well, I'm gonna do I'm gonna defend, I'm gonna talk. So it wasn't an issue for me. You keep coming back to, you've thrown up a lot since the start of your college basketball career. How do you put into words the amount of growth from Caleb Mills when you showed up at Houston to Caleb Mills fast forward four or five years later here? It's the complete opposite, I guess. Um, I'm still, I still have a, like a killer mindset, but um, I'm more focused on the team winning, you know what I'm saying? So even, so back then, I used to try to guard. Now I'm, I like, that's like a staple of my game, you know? Um, I take pride on defense and um, try to make as many plays as I can. The 2019 National Champs and that team from Nashville make a stop at FedEx Forum this week. We'll preview Virginia and Vanderbilt. Coming up next. You're watching The Penny Hardaway Show, presented by Cook's Pest Control. Let's take a look at the AutoZone Road Ahead. This week is going to be a fantastic week. We start with Virginia. Is this going to be just black and blue when everybody's done here? Man, it seems like that's what it's going to be because they junk the game up. They jog it up and they play great defense. So, you know, we got to try to speed the game up at some point. Uh, Coach Bennett does a great job. They want to make it 40 to 41. That's all <laughs> in the game, and we have to try to speed it up. Vandy was the opener last year, probably the hottest gym I've ever been in. Mm -hmm. uh, a year later, they're coming here against Stack, in-state rivalry. How important is that one to you? Very important because, you know, recruiting, also the bragging rights over Stack, and having a home game. You know, that game is, is so important. We can't overlook that game because they're very capable. He's a fantastic coach, and he'll have his team ready to play. I, I know uh, we, Memphis played at Vandy last year. Is that a series you want to continue? Because you're going to play Virginia at Virginia in a year. Yeah, that's definitely something that I want to continue. You know, I'm trying to keep the interstate in -state rivalry going with us in Tennessee. Hopefully we can get Tennessee back, but I definitely want to keep Vanderbilt going. That was tonight's AutoZone Road Ahead. AutoZone, America's number one battery destination and official sponsor of Tiger Athletics. Get in the zone, AutoZone. Penny Hardaway, he'll play anybody, anywhere, anytime. We put a wrap on this one in just a minute. You're watching The Penny Hardaway Show, presented by Cook's Pest Control. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next Sunday night. Have a great week, everybody. The Penny Hardaway Show is presented by Cook's Pest Control. You don't have to live with pests. Call Cook's Pest Control and get a free quote today. Conway Services, the official HVAC partner of Tiger Athletics. Tennessee Lottery, turning dollars into dreams. Tiger Bookstore, the official merchandiser of Tiger Athletics. AutoZone, when you've got car trouble, you want help from number one. So if you've got a battery problem, head to AutoZone, America's number one battery destination. Get in the zone, AutoZone. And supported by your Memphis area Toyota dealers. This copyrighted telecast is an exclusive presentation of Learfield under the broadcasting rights granted by the University of Memphis. Reuse of this presentation is prohibited without the expressed written consent of the University of Memphis and Learfield.